It is February 1st, 2022. We are broadcasting and streaming surgery of the spine live over the internet on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. For those of you watching, the surgery is being streamed live so that we can answer questions and we can engage the audience and bring you in to participate by watching and listening and observing and asking questions. All right, Dr. Duke here, we're gonna get started, okay? I'm gonna give you some medicine, a little injection of some local that should help ease the discomfort. But if at any time you have pain, just say, ouch. Okay. Don't move your body, just say, ouch, and I will give you some more numbing medicine, okay? All right, so our patient has two herniated discs, L4-5, L5-S1, and L4-5 is herniated on both sides, so there's a tear and herniation on both sides. It's hitting nerves on both sides, so we're gonna go on both sides to fix L4-5. L5-S1, on the other hand, is just on the left. I think we're off on orbit by one degree, maybe even a half a degree. You can see the double shadow in the back of five at the top, you see that? Just the slightest amount, maybe he moved. Shot, that's better, that's better. But you know what, S1 shifted, didn't it? So let's go back, <laughs> yeah, because the S1 superior facet is now offset. Actually, that is better, let's go a little more. So again, as, as typical, we have a little scoliosis. Let's try a little more, I wonder if that's better or worse. That seems to be maybe even worse right there. Yeah, it's worse, so let's go back. And this brings up, let's try a little bit more. Uh, you know what, just a slight bit more, like half a degree. I think that's about as good as we're gonna get it. All right, so to do this type of surgery, we have to navigate from the outside world out here down to the bad disc. And to navigate, we need something to guide us, just like the old captains that sailed ships on the ocean at night, they used the stars to navigate. And um, we're gonna use an x-ray machine with pictures of the spine. Are you comfy? We're gonna get started. Little stick. A little burn, that's just the numbing medicine going in. You're doing great. I'm so happy you don't care. All right, so we're numbing up the left side and we're gonna do the same thing for the right side. We're gonna numb the skin up because that's gonna make it more comfortable. You know, <clears throat> something that we don't talk much about which is innervation of pain fibers. Pain fibers are not found everywhere in the human body. It's only found in certain locations. And the skin is highly innervated because let's face it, you wanna know if there's something entering your body from the outside world as soon as it starts to enter. Um, so you can do something about it. So the skin is highly innervated with pain fibers as is fascia, which are like thick connective barriers, walls. Um, muscles have a little bit of pain fibers, bone, the periosteum does, the surface membrane. Uh, but aside from that, the dura does, but not too many other things do. All right, I may have to be a little more north. Let me see. Shot? Uh-huh, I think I need to be a little more north for sure. So I think we're still numbed up here. We should be good. We'll try again. So the entry point, um, starting point, is important, very important. So you have to select your entry point very carefully. Shot. And for those of you who have never done this kind of surgery as a surgeon, you really need training before you can start doing it. It's not something you can watch a YouTube video on and do it. And the training you're gonna need is gonna be extensive, Sean. It's basically a year-long fellowship at a minimum. 
six months. And that's if you're a very quick learner and you have a really good foundation. Shot? And what I mean by quick learner and good foundation is just that. You're very smart and you have a very good understanding of anatomy and you have a lot of experience as a spine surgeon doing surgery. Shot? Then you can learn this faster. Shot? All right, I'm up against the facet. I'm a little higher than I want to be. It's easy to um, not be in the right place. It's hard to be in the right place, shot. So I can feel the iliac crest, shot. And the iliac crest can sometimes force you, shot, to go um, further north than you want to be. And so I have to navigate the iliac crest. And a little secret of mine that I've learned over the years, shot, is that when you encounter the iliac crest as an obstacle, a lot of times you need to go more medial, shot, rather than um, any other direction. Going more medial can typically be very helpful, shot. All right, I'm hitting the facet, this S1 superior facet, shot. Still a little bit higher than I want to be. And we've got a pretty good floral shot. You can see the L5-S1 disc space is very collapsed, but I need to be a little bit further south. Shot. So I'm gonna try to use my, my needle and to navigate down there, shot. And are you awake? Any pain? So we're awfully close to where we need to be. Let's get an AP. We'll let him wake up just a little bit more. So because the disc space is so collapsed in the back, it's open in the front, but you can see in the back it's collapsed. I have a maybe a five millimeter at most window to access the back of the disc. And the reason it's so collapsed is this patient's had a tear in the back of his disc at L5-S1 for years and it's just over time degraded uh, the disc so it's collapsed. It's like a, having a flat tire that you don't address and over time it just gets flatter and flatter and more collapsed. Any pain? No pain down the leg, right? Let's go AP. Okay. So we're on the left side. And on the left side, we're doing two discs, four, five, five, one. On the right side, we're just doing the four, five, which I'm thankful about because four, five is so much easier to get into. Five, one is the hardest. And just so you all know, um, endoscopic, transferaminal lumbar spine surgeons like myself are few and far between. In the United States, there's probably less than 50 of us, maybe even less than 25, could even be less than 10 that are actually practicing. But L5-S1 is one that they don't treat, transferaminal, because it's so hard to access. You okay? Sean? Okay, good. Shot. Okay, we are in 5-1. I'm pretty darn happy with that, considering how collapsed it is. The other thing to note is, look how short the S1 pedicle is. Show them the S1 pedicle. This is important. We call this congenital stenosis. Congenital, yes, uh, to the right. Yep, right there, that's the back of the sacrum. And now go to the left just a little bit. Right there is the pedicle. And look at this, look, show them the S1 superior facet. That little mountain right above your, just go up the mountain to the right. Yep, there it is, go up, up. It looks like the Matterhorn right there. There you go, that's the S1 superior facet. Now from there, right where her arrow is to the back of the vertebral body, which is right there, <laughs> that's the amount of distance that I have because of the S1 
pedicle, which is abnormally short. That's not a lot of distance to get into the disc. Normally, show them the more normal distance higher up at the next level. Normally, there's a lot of distance from the facet to the back of the disc. Show them that, yes, that distance there. More distance, easier. Sh less distance, much harder, almost impossible. That's why surgeons don't do L5-S1, but at Duke Spine Institute, we do it all the time. I've had probably one out of 100 patients I cannot get L5-S1 because it's inaccessible. And that's usually due to a variety of twisting of the spine, slipping of the bones, bone spurs, hypertrophied facet, et cetera. What's that? Well, no, no, table should go down. You want to drop the spine down or fluoro up, one of the two. But drop the table a little bit, just a little bit. That's good. Let's see what we got. All right, you can leave it pretty much there. So we've got 5-1. Now we're going to go for L4-5 since I'm doing both on this side. First, I'm going to make a little incision. Are you comfy, sir? Okay, definitely not right there. We're going to need a little more local. All right, I'm going to give you some more medicine then. You're doing fine, okay? Just relax. You're doing great. Everything's good. So it's important when you're dealing with an awake patient, it changes the way you do the surgery and the anesthesia. But you really want to make sure the patient knows that everything's okay. When they feel pain, they're not sure. You know, they sit there and go, am I supposed to be feeling that? So they get scared, like maybe my th things aren't going right. So you want to reassure them that when they are going right that everything's going right. Everything's okay. You're doing great. Yeah. All right. This is a seven millimeter incision, big enough to put the tube that we're doing the surgery in through. We're gonna put that tube in here, and that's all. That's all we need is the endoscopic tube. Now remember, we did five one, now we're going for four five. Shot? All right. You're gonna drop the table another quarter inch to a half inch. One more? Good, perfect. Shot? All right, so, shot. I like to come in and dock my um, spinal needle on the facet. Shot? Okay. And when I get to the facet, I can feel it. It's bony. You can't miss it. And you know you're right on the lateral border. And then I start going medial. <laughs> I like to stay low in the foramen. Shot? Not that low. You comfy? Mm -hmm. You all right? Yeah, just there. Shot? All right, we're right there. You can actually see the herniated disc on that x-ray. AP? Any pain in your leg? Well, do you have any pain? Well, just do all the back pain only. All right. You're doing great. We're almost done. We're, I mean, almost done with the part we need you awake for. Once again, you can see the tip of the needle at L4-5 is just outside the disc. You can see the pedicle of 4 and 5. We're almost at the mid-pedicular zone. So you can see we're about to enter the disc. So it's absolutely perfect placement. I use my pedicles at 4 and 5 lined up, especially 5. Um, there's a little bit of parallax at 4 or scoliosis. You can see the pedicles of 4 offset. But the most important to have the pedicles of the vertebral body below the disc um, lined up and that's what we've done so you can see the herniation show them the herniation with your arrow it's really right where the tip of the needle is that's the herniation it's a little bit denser yep you can see it right there it's kind of bulging out all right are you comfy so we need them awake for this all right can feel the herniation can feel your herniation you got a big tear went in so easy so we're going to fix that for you with the Duke laser disc repair. He said perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, everything is going perfect. Let me know if you're uncomfortable at all. You can see the blanching of the skin where we injected him. So I'm just going to go in right here. And um,
shot. Yeah, I'm going to give him a little numbing medicine. It almost looks like we're low there, right, Luis? Shot? I'm going to start a little bit higher. What's that? So we're going to approach from the right side. Shot. And I'm giving some numbing medicine as I'm doing this. To make it more comfortable as we pass through the fascia, the dorsal fascia. Okay. Shot. Can feel it, shot. Shot, there's the facet. We just gotta wrap around it. Shot. And then we're gonna enter the disc, shot. Right where the tear is, shot. You okay? Yes. Shot, AP. So once again, we're in the foramen at four five low and I'm right at the back of the herniation you can actually see the herniation there at the tip of the new needle uh, perfect any pain in your leg good we're gonna put you to sleep soon but I need your help for just a few more minutes shut all right you're doing great Shot. A lot of scar tissue. Unfortunately, I can feel it. You're doing really good. So far, five drops of blood. You comfy? Are you having any pain right now? Lower back, or yeah, yeah. so we need him awake for a few more minutes. Responsive. Remember, we're here to treat two discs. The L45 um, has two problems. It has a tear on both sides, and through that tear, the jelly is pushed out. We call it a herniation. And this part right here, we call it number one. That's the interposed nucleus that causes back pain. And number two, this part sticking out hits the nerve roots going down his leg, and that causes his leg pain. So we have back pain and leg pain. Uh, responsible from two different areas of the herniation. The tear, back pain. The part that sticks out, leg pain. All right, are you better? Okay, still awake, right? All right. And he knows everything about this surgery. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? Is that where you typically get your back pain? So L4-5, right there you guys can see the tear in the back of the disc. It goes all the way to the back of the vertebral body and a little bit of dye leaks out in the foramen. That tear is a grade 4 tear. It's huge. You could drive a bus through that thing. All right. And um, that's at 045. So 9 out of 10 concordant. So let's mark that down. So this disc right here, L45, is a 9 over 10, and it's concordant. What that means is that is his typical daily back pain that he gets every day. So we found one of the discs that caused his regular back pain. And now we're gonna see if the other one does too. Are you comfortable? Yeah. All right. How bad is that? How high did it go? How high up did it go on a scale of one to 10? What's the highest it went? Let's say nine over 10. 
Is that where you typically get back pain? All right. Now all I can say is happy trails to you. Count from 1 to 100 out loud in Chinese for us. Can you do that? No? All right. How about in, in, in Boston? In Bostonian? How about in New English? From 1 to 100. You're in the South now, my friend. <laughs> All right, so yes, we're having fun a little bit with you. Um, obviously, you're from Boston, and we're really happy you're here because we're going to cure your pain. Nine out of ten. That's what this disc, L5-S1, is. L5-S1. So L5-S1 has a herniation kind of on the left side, L4-5 on both sides. And it's not the herniation that causes back pain, folks. It's the tear. And that's what we discovered at Duke Spine Institute. And I use a laser to clean the tear. You're going to see that in a minute. That gets rid of the back pain. Just so you know, if you watched our surgery earlier today, the first one, that patient is already gone. And she went home, back to her hotel, actually. And her pain is completely gone in her back and in her left leg. So left leg pain gone, back pain gone. She has a little tenderness from the incision where we did the surgery. OK, you got the. My guide wire shot. Okay, looks good. This is 5-1. Coming out, shot. Make sure the guide wire is in deep enough. So we're going to fix L5-S1 first. I'm taking my spinal needle out. Our patient is definitely an alien with green blood, greenish blue blood, shot. And we're going to bring this dilator down. Now, you know this is a true patriot because just look here. Red, white, and blue. Okay? You see that? If you tell a Bostonian that, they, they take pride in it. They bleed red, white, and blue. That's right. shot okay so I'm making my way down we are not cutting anything we're using what's called a dilator in medicine a dilator spreads tissues it doesn't hurt them it spreads them and when we're done we're gonna pull this out and all the tissues are gonna go back and collapse back to where they were before without damage so the only thing we've damaged is the skin by cutting it and then we're going to go straight through the tear that's already there and the herniation. Shot? All right. We're in the foramen now. Moving past the S1 facet to the back of the disc. So I've done as much as I can pushing and twisting with my hands. I'm going to use the mallet to bring this further down safely. Okay. I want to look at my angles and make sure the angles are right. So I can direct this. All right, lay still. You're okay. You're fine. Just relax. Everything's okay. I'm going to just wait a minute, Sean. And I want to pull my guide wire back just a little bit. I don't want it advancing too much. So, Sean. And we're right on the back of the disc at this point. This is the tear that's painful. So we're going to pass through and into the disc itself. The center of the disc doesn't have any pain fibers, folks. It's just the outside, the outer fibers that do. You're fine. Should I wait? Yep, no problem. I'll wait. We're going to give you a little more medicine. Everything's okay, though. Yeah, you're doing really good. So we've started going into the 5-1 disc shot, and I'm going to finish this in just a moment. We want to give our patient a little bit more anesthesia to make him a little sleepier. Remember, this is not general anesthesia. Our patients are not 
on volatile gases, p chemically paralyzed completely out. They're just getting sedation. We call it twilight. Looking good. All right, folks, the whole surgery will be done through a tube. And we use an endoscope to go down this tube so I can see what's at the bottom here. You all see this? Can you see this, Kevin? Yes, sir. So we're going to enter here with all of our surgery equipment, including our endoscope, and we're going to be looking down here at the end. This is as minimally invasive as spine surgery gets. You'll hear surgeons talk about minimally invasive, but they don't do this surgery. They're not really doing minimally invasive. But the truth is they don't even realize, many of them, that they're not doing minimally invasive. They think they're doing minimally invasive. But a lot of surgeons tell patients they're minimally invasive because they want the business, but they're not really minimally invasive surgeons. So shot. This surgery we're doing today is truly minimally invasive. Take a look. The whole surgery is going to be done through this tube, seven millimeters wide. Our blood loss will be less than five mils. And please don't try this at home. So that rep got you the fiber overnight, huh? Yes, we got it. She's good, huh? Good. I like her. Anyone that's that responsive, I like. <laughs> but you had to buy her Chick-fil-A? You All right, good. You good? All right. So notice the angle here for L5S1 is pretty steep. We're not going in like this, we're going down like that. And again, L5S1 is really hard to get to. Most endoscopic surgeons don't do it. Transferaminal, they'll oh, just go. And then we need the angle on the they'll go interlaminar. I need the scope on. <clears throat> the and just so you know, interlaminar is not good for the patient. It's not good. Um, now you're taking bone out, you're taking uh, ligaments out, you're destabilizing the whole spine. Uh, lights off, please, Rita. All right, we got our first bit of herniation right here. Thank you very much. All right. You, you can see the limitations of grabbing instruments, traditional spine instruments like the pituitary. They just cannot really effectively remove the herniation, and they cannot, um, they definitely cannot debride the tear. Annular tear debridement requires a laser. <clears throat> All right, so we'll get started with the laser. Oh, I missed that, the other one. <laughs> we're at back to 30? Yeah, yes. Okay, here we go. So we're back to the old fiber. The last surgery we used, the thicker fiber, and I think everyone likes it better, including me. It's actually more efficient using a one millimeter fiber than a half a mil. But you can see the caliber diameter difference. This is a much skinnier fiber, but it does do a good job. It just takes longer. And when you're talking about surgeries with patients under anesthesia, time is of the essence. The longer the surgery, the higher the chance of complications. So to minimize complications, you want to shorten the duration of the surgery without compromising your end result quality of the outcome with respect to treatment of pain. Okay, beautiful. Did, uh, did my wife talk to you, Dr. Berndes, about Wednesday? Okay. 
There, we have a handyman coming by. And he needs to fix something, I guess a shade or something. So. All right, Kevin, what questions do we have from our audience? We need the audience to ask questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to babble. Babble on about nothing important. There's no questions so far, sir. All right. Sky's the limit. Who has a question? Comment. Now, did you do pain management? You, I thought you mentioned you had done some pain management. You have. Uh, in that in residency or actual practice? Did you enjoy it? Yeah. You did interventional or medication? Yeah, of course. You do transferaminal, interlaminar, caudal. Okay. All right, so this is the second surgery for the day at Duke Spine, and we have a third one after this, but this is a Duke laser disc repair. This patient has herniated discs, one at L45, one at L5S1. He has bilateral leg symptoms, pain in both legs, I think some weakness, numbness, and we need both legs feeling better. So because the L45 herniations on both sides, I could see it on the MRI, we know L45 needs both sides done. The L5S1, on the other hand, is primarily left-sided. So that's why we're doing a left 5-1 and a bilateral 4-5. Now our patient has traveled to Duke Spine Institute from Boston, Massachusetts. Of course, Duke Spine Institute in 2022 is located in near Orlando, Florida, but really closer to SpaceX and NASA. We're 10 minutes from SpaceX launch pads and NASA. We are located in the space coast of Florida near Brevard County. And we've been here now for 16 years. When I was a resident in neurosurgery and training, resident fellow, I used to come down and I was one of the doctors that took care of the astronauts that was part of this shuttle program, the space shuttle program, and we would come and train on base with the uh, protocols, with the uh, NASA personnel, and there were a group of about four of us, including surgeon, ER doc, anesthesiologist, and either another surgeon or an ER doc. And we would basically staff the launches and landings of the shuttles, and I was part of that for many years. Um, that's how I got familiar with this area. And so when a job opportunity opened up here at the hospitals, Parish Medical Center, Rustoff Rockledge, I took the job. And I've been here in the same place now 16 years. We're about 45 minutes from Orlando Airport. All of our patients fly in through Orlando, but some of them find it easier to fly into Melbourne. There is a Melbourne International Airport close by. We have three satellite launches this week from SpaceX. Everybody know about that? Yeah, it's a record. Three in one week, as long as they do launch. Huh? Anybody know the launch schedule for SpaceX this week? One today. One today, what time? Usually we know because the building shakes. So if you're in California, maybe you think it's an earthquake. And there was a launch yesterday, 6 p.m., 6 a.m. So one, one uh, SpaceX rocket launched yesterday. Of course, they're delivering the satellites. Starlink, everybody probably knows about those. So 
Then when is the next launch? Today? Lynn? All right, so I think there's another one either tomorrow or today. Today at 6 o'clock. Tonight? Yes, yes sir. you got to speak up a little bit, Kevin. We can't hear you. Yes, sir, tonight at 6 o'clock. Tonight at 6 p.m., second, second rocket launch. And the third one, is it Friday? All right. Yes, sir. All right, very good. So I, I, I've never told you guys this, and honestly, I don't care at this point, but I might as well tell you. But um, about a year ago, Jeff Bezos came to the Space Coast here because his rocket company is here, Blue Origin, and he stayed at my house for two days while he visited Blue Origin. It was top secret, but now that it's been over a year, I don't feel obligated to keep it top secret anymore. Huh? I was a prime member, but I've been unhappy with them lately, and I haven't said anything to Jeff about it. But, um, he was supposed to come back, but never made it back. I don't know what's going on. I think he's a bit miffed about losing the contract for NASA. But um, there you have it. He brought 24 people with him. <laughs> Only a few people know about this wipe, but now the rest of the world can know. A ticket to fly? No. No. I don't know. I would love to. I've always dreamed about going into space. But I just have some apprehension. You know, God forbid something bad happens and I die. Then who's going to do these surgeries? So I have somewhat of a responsibility to the world to continue. You know, this is more important than me flying and going into space right now. Huh? Well, someday, right, it will be like Captain Kirk. That was my favorite program as a kid, by the way. Yeah. Star Trek? Absolutely. And I watched all the good programs. Knight Rider. Um... What was the Tom Selleck one? Uh, Hawaii, no, not Hawaii. Yeah. Magnum P.I., right? Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> oh, right, those are great shows. We were very lucky. Knight Rider. The Six Million Dollar, was Six Million Dollar Man? Huh? Right? Wonder Woman. That was fun. Charlie's Angels, the original. We were lucky to have such great programming on television. Now it's just garbage on TV. Like I try to get my kids to watch the old stuff, you know? Because the new stuff is just terrible. It doesn't teach them anything. No values, morals, ethics. Tell me I'm wrong. It's just sad to see what's happened over the years. All right, let's see what we've got here. Starting to get out towards the foramen. Just, we're right at the most painful area. Yeah. 
We'll just wait a minute, take that. So any questions from our audience, Kevin? No questions still. What are you saying, Rita? Oh. Just about done at L5S1 here. I'm using the grabber to try to remove any pieces of disc material that are available, herniation that's available to be removed. And heading back in with the laser. Oh yeah, he's not ready yet, huh? Wait a little bit. How much time you need? Okay. I'll go deeper into the disc where there's not as many pain fibers. The outer part of the disc is definitely the most painful part. And that's the last part we deal, deal with is the outer half of the disc right at the end. And that's, that's when uh, patients can actually, you know, start to feel it. Better? Seems to be better controlled. Okay, laser off, grab her. Next, we're gonna move to L45 in just a minute. I want to make sure we've gotten everything we can on this one. I think I can get a little bit more. Yeah, I can definitely get a little more. We good? Elaine from Facebook has a question. Elaine. Do you take Medicare or Aetna insurance for surgery? Did you? Uh, the question was very fast. I think you said, do you take Medicare or Aetna insurance for surgeries? Is that correct? Correct. Yes, Elaine, thank you for asking. We do. We take Aetna uh, and Medicare does pay for some types of surgeries, but not the Duke laser disc repair, unfortunately. We expect it will in the future, but it's going to take some advocating by patients in order for that to happen. So currently, if you're a Medicare patient, you're going to have to pay out of pocket for the laser surgery. Aetna, though, we do take, and we have been paid in the past by Aetna. So we expect to bill Aetna and get paid. But Medicare doesn't really cover any new technologies. Medicare is not interested in covering any new technology. They, uh, they want to save money. And new technology, unfortunately, does cost money. Great question, though. All right. We still recommend you do the surgery. It's much safer and more effective than any Medicare covered surgery. If you're able to, of course. Not everybody is, but this is so advanced technologically and the results are second to none. We literally are able to cure pain with this surgery. Back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain. Depends on where your herniation is, but um, we've had not had a single patient that we didn't eliminate their disc pain with this procedure. Okay, just about done. I just want to look, make sure we've gotten everything we can at 5-1. Once again, this is the hardest disc to fix. Remember we talked about that? 
Let me just pull it out a little bit further. Let me see the grabber one more time. Just leave it in. We're outside the disc there. And I'm just thinking I can get a little bit more. Let's see what I can do here. You can see the a little bit of blue dye there. Not much left. We're just about done here. Yep. All right. I think that's good. Okay, we're done at 5-1. We're going to move up to 4-5. So stick with us. And we'll move to the next disc and the next side. A little bit of betadine, antiseptic. Don't need much. We used to use uh, bacitracin in our irrigation for endoscopic surgery, but um, it's sort of fallen out of favor. We can still use it, but unfortunately, when a drug is not really used by many people anymore, it becomes very, very, inex very expensive to, uh, to use it. Um, we used to pay a few dollars for bacitracin, 50,000 units to go in the irrigation per liter. And now it's hundreds of dollars. So unfortunately, because everyone stopped using it, even though it's still safe to use, you just can't you know, do an uh, intramuscular injection of it, which we weren't doing anyway. The problem, though, is that it's fallen out of favor. And as a result, the costs have skyrocketed because nobody uses it. So the cost to manufacture it is no longer spread out over many users. It's concentrated to the few people that do use it. So we've just been unable to, uh, to use it, and we used betadine instead at the end, which you can see we injected a little bit down the tube. We suck all of it out, of course. Betadine is very safe to use. It's been used for years and years in surgery. And it's a topical antibiotic, meaning we don't inject it in the veins or the muscle. We just use it in the ir near the irrigated areas. Now, of course, we wash it all out right after we put it in. But we give it a minute or two to do its job of killing back any bacteria. We don't have any bacteria here, but, you know, as a precautionary measure, surgeons always irrigate their wounds once they're done just to prevent any any infection from occurring in the event that a couple of bacteria got in there somehow, which once again, we don't put any bacteria in there, but somehow you know, infections do happen in surgery all around the world and anything you can do to minimize the risk of infection is always good. So irrigating the wound when you're done is always part of everybody's routine. Uh, it's pretty standard and using a antibiotic that would kill bacteria is the most common um, irrigant. There are really four main types of microbes that we know about. There's a fifth as well, but those four types of microbes are bacteria, viruses, fungus, and protozoans. And in the United States, in surgical theaters like ours, your biggest risk is bacteria. So you want to use a, a bactericidal product, and that's what we do. We're not so worried about viruses infecting surgical wounds or fungus we do worry about, but protozoans and uh, Viruses don't really cause post-operative wound infections. Um, bacteria is the number one by far, and then some funguses as well. The fifth organism, does anyone know what it is? I'm sure Dr. Berndis does. Fungus. 
fungus and protozoa. And the fifth one is something called, no, protozoa, I mean parasites, protozoans, things like that. Um, but it's a prion, which is not really a virus. It's a protein that is weird. <laughs> yeah, kreutzfeldt jakob disease in humans. It affects the brain tissue and causes people to go crazy. They get demented. They have uh, psychosis and myoclonic jerks. Point is, it's really bad because you can't kill it. And you just have to make sure you never spread it. I don't think I've seen a single case. Maybe one in residency. One case. We did a brain biopsy on a patient that had suspected kreutzfeldt jakob disease. These people usually give a history of eating brains of animals that are infected or uh, eating foods that have been contaminated by brain matter, like in a slaughterhouse. So just another reason to go vegetarian. <laughs> All right. But like I said, we don't worry about prions, we don't worry about protozoans, and we don't worry about, or it's our parasites, and we don't worry about uh, viruses when it comes to post-operative wound infections. We worry about bacteria and fungus, and of course the most important is bacteria. So the antibiotic I use, uh, betadine, kills bacteria very effectively. It even kills, kills fungus as well. Shot. NASA developed it as a polymicrobial um, wash for uh, astronauts to use. And space scientists to use because they didn't know what they were going to bring back from space. You've all seen those sci-fi movies, right? Ridley Scott, Alien. We had a question from Colton. Prometheus, that's your son? All right, Colton, hit us up. Do you have any experience with endoscopic surgery on younger patients around 20 to 22 years old? Yes, uh, we, need, we need to see the scope, please. Yes, we do. Uh, Listen, younger patients do get injuries to their disc. Guys, we need the scope on. Younger people do get herniated discs and disc injuries. And they are painful, okay? So something you need to be aware of is that it, is, it does happen. It's, it's less common than older adults, but Anyone can have a disc injury, okay? And you can be five years old with a disc injury, an annular tear and herniation and back pain. As a matter of fact, I met a woman about three months ago on Facebook. Her daughter is only two years old and is, in, is having back pain from a herniated disc. So, of course, you're not gonna operate on a two-year-old. You're gonna wait and see if it gets better in time, but for sure, you know, younger people get herniated discs. I've operated on as young as 15. And that was a young lady out of um, Los Angeles who went to all the top orthopedics in LA. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. She had back pain for years. She was a skier, like a semi-pro skier, played sports. Anyway, always complaining of back pain was she was blown off by the doctors. They said, you're too young to have problems with your back. It's because they don't understand. Anyway, she came here. I found a herniated disc at 045 and we did a laser surgery. Her pain went away immediately. So absolutely, young people do get herniated discs with back pain. and. If you wait, you're just prolonging the inevitable to fix it. So get it fixed properly early. 
What are the ways to fix it? Two ways, this way, the endoscopic procedure, which is safe, doesn't cause any permanent damage to your body, except the little scar in your skin, seven millimeters. And we can repair the tear and debride it. That's the best way in the world to do it, what you're watching right now. The other option is to do a fusion, where we would clean out the whole disc, put in a cage, and then screws and rods. And finally, you could do an artificial disc as well. Take out the bad disc, put in a metal disc. But I will tell you, artificial discs, I'm totally against. Why? Number one, they're very dangerous to put in. And number two, they don't work. And number three, they pop out. And then you're going to have multiple surgeries, more than one, to fix it and all kinds of complications from it. So. I am 100% against artificial discs. It's not even a question, maybe. I won't put them in. If I have a patient that comes to me and says I want an artificial disc, I will say, okay, great. Um, but there's better options. If they're still dead set on artificial discs, I'll tell them go get someone else to do it because I'm not going to do it. I don't care how much money they pay me, I'm not going to do it because I just know they're bad. They cause complications, horrible complications. So I'm about safety and effectiveness, safe and effective treatments. And the safest, most effective treatment for a herniated disc in the world is this surgery you're watching right now. We've had zero surgical complications. That means is there's been no complication from the surgeon. We had one anesthesia complication and zero surgical in 1,400 surgeries. There's no other spine surgery in the world that has that record. So we know this is the safest and it's the most effective. Great question, by the way. Thanks for asking. So the youngest is 15, but I know there's lots of people out there that need it. They're unfortunately um, they're at the mercy of their treating physicians who honestly don't know anything about the surgery yet because it's still young and uh, the information has not spread around the world yet, but it's starting. And a lot of people are finding out about the surgery either online, whether it's our website, our app, or Facebook, or Instagram, or YouTube. They're learning about that this surgery exists and that it can fix their problem. So yes, we don't discriminate based on age. Pain doesn't discriminate, why should we? I think the oldest patient I've operated on was in his 90s and the youngest patient I've operated on was 15 and everything in between. Great question. Any other questions? See the tear. Just how, uh, look at all this white stuff, collagenized it is. This is L45, left side. We're going to go to the right side soon and we'll fix that side as well. This is the herniation right here that I'm zapping out. This is the outer part of the herniation. So you can see it pushing. And the tear is all through here. It needs to all be cleaned up. Scar tissue from chronic inflammation. So yeah, Luis, definitely buy three of those yeah, fibers. Tomorrow. We have it tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, let's make that our primary no fiber. You can have both out, you know, if you want. Yes, sir. Um, but I think I think we're on to something here. For the next case, you want to start with the big one or the side fire? The big one. Big one? Yes. Just have it, just a stand by side fire. Because the side fire is only one time use. I know. Okay. Which side fire are we going to use? It's only one, sir. 
I thought you had two. No, it's only one. You had the expensive oh. one? It's only one. And it's <laughs> oh, I thought yeah. we saw on the website there's no, two. but I asked the rep and they said it's, it's only one. And the one they have is the expensive one? It's a, yes. Of yes. course. So, that's unfortunate. Oh, look at that inflammatory tissue right there. So um, the side firing laser, is there only one company that manufactures it that we can use? Yeah, the thing is uh, they're not all compatible with this machine. So but what about the company that makes the machine? They use Boston. That's they don't have their yeah, own? No, they don't have their own. No. Interesting. So it looks like they have a you know, contract. So they have a contract with Boston? Like with yes, sir. Interesting. So Okay, well, we're just talking business here. Since you guys aren't asking any more questions, we're just talking business. Yeah, you can see how the disc moves here. This is a more recent herniation. And uh, by the way, this is normal nucleus propulsus, this stuff here. It's not staining blue and it's not scarred up. So we're not gonna mess with that part. We're just dealing with the tear and the degenerated nuclear material that's stuck in the tear. But the rest of the nucleus, the rest of the disc, we leave alone. I'm sure you guys can see that. This stuff here is all scarred up from inflammation. But this is good nucleus right here, that big piece of bubble gum. We're not messing with that. This is the tear right here. So we're just gonna finish up here and then we'll be done on this side and then we're gonna go on to the other side. Everything's going very well right now. We have had no problems. We're just wrapping up this laser at 045. So some of you may be wondering, why Dr. Duke Majin, dude, did you discover this procedure and how come no one else knows about it? Well, the reality is, is, you know, pioneers are pioneers. Let's face it, not everybody in the world is a pioneer. And to be a pioneer, you have to master something. And then you have to realize its limitations and go beyond those limitations with new ideas or technology. And that's what we've done here. So we've mastered surgery of the spine with traditional techniques. And we realize that traditional techniques have limitations. So um, you can't see inside the disc with traditional spine surgery. You can't see the tear like we see it right now. The only way to do that is endoscopically. So we had to take endoscopic technology and bring it to the spine. And that was done by Dr. Uh, Parvis Camden and several spine surgeons ahead of me. So they're pioneers in this technology. They taught me the basics, like how to use an endoscope, how to use a laser, uh, how to get inside the disc. But once I was inside the disc, I realized that what they were doing outside the disc wasn't enough, that something had to be done with the tear. And every time I went in and cleaned up the tear so it would heal properly, patients did better. Their back pain went away. Their neck pain went away if I was working on their cervical spine. And then it, it wasn't long before I realized that the cleaning of the tear is what was getting rid of the back and neck pain. Not, not just the leg pain and arm pain, but the back and neck pain and headaches, you know, that people get when they have a herniated disc in their neck. So I started to, uh, you know, develop the technique of annular debridement more and more to make it more complete. And I started to think about why would an annular debridement get rid of pain? And that's when I realized the pain pathways that were involved that made sense with somatic afferents and primary somatosensory cortex and the pathways and the innervation of the back of the disc and the sinovertebral nerve. And of course, building on studies that were performed by other scientists before me, after me, like Cloward, who studied uh, <coughs> lumbar back pain with open surgery, pushing on areas of the disc to find where the pain was. He recognized that it was the posterior annulus that was the source of back pain, not the side, not the front. So he described that, that the posterior annulus had a different innervation basically, that patients perceived as highly localized pain. So I took that 
and built on it. Recognizing the annular tear and inflammation as being the source of pain. Laser. There's some herniation right there. Herniated nucleus propulsus. Staining blue with our dye. The Duke spine dye. The Duke spine dye basically stains degenerated nuclear material, which is that material which has been under the influence of inflammation and inflammatory mediators. And it's basically acidic, highly acidic. Okay, one minute. These white fibers are uh, annulus. And this stuff is all co collagenized or scarred from inflammation and calcified. That's why you have a golden color. Okay. Just going to finish this last bit up and we'll be done here. We're going to go on to the right side. You want to switch sides with me, Luis? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Luis and I will do a little dance. And I'm going to go to the other side. It's easier for me to operate on the side that, uh, stand on the side that I'm operating on. So it's true for every surgeon. 30 seconds. See the normal disc here, and the um, blue stuff is the under influence of inflammation, herniated disc. All this stuff here at 12 o'clock. Those fibers there that you're seeing, the white fibers, are the posterior longitudinal ligament, PLL. All right, and just past these fibers is going to be the epidural space. That's where the nerves are, and blood vessels, and fat. Any other questions from our audience before we wrap this side up? No, sir. So it's funny. Uh, my kids started a new school, high school, last year. Lake Highland Prep. And it's all the very uh, well-to-do people in Orlando send their kids there, but it's got a good college prep school, right? And Arias has now got into Princeton, so combination of his earlier work and, of course, Lake Highland, the support he's gotten with racing has been excellent. Nothing bad to say about the school, but um, they have an annual fundraiser, and they, the school asked for donations, so I donated a Duke Laser Disc Repair Surgery. <laughs> but but nobody knew what the Duke laser disc repair was, grabber. So even though I donated a, a disc to be repaired to anybody with back pain, nobody nobody bought it. It went unbought, and it was just a thousand dollars. And think about what people pay to have this surgery done is a lot more than that. So it's just funny how. Because people have no idea what it is, they don't value it. Yet, I'm sure there's lots of people in Orlando with chronic back pain that would have benefited from the surgery and saved a lot of money. So that just shows how new technology is graded as it is. Do we have irrigation here? I mean, suction yes. can be underappreciated by even the people it's designed to benefit for a long time. I'm going to laugh about that one for a long time. Okie dokie, done with the left side, now we have the right side.
to go. Our patient is doing fantastic. We put a little pressure to stop any bleeding in the muscle that might occur from a torn vein. Um, typically we don't get any bleeding in the muscle, but it's better to put pressure anyway. We put pressure on every patient, you got it? And the reason is if somebody does get a little bit of blood in the muscle, then they're gonna have pain in the muscle and muscle spasms for probably at least two weeks after the surgery. So the, a little bit of muscle bl blood doesn't affect the results of the surgery, but it creates more post-operative pain in the patient, which we want to avoid. Okay, last disc. Again, this is L45, the right side. And we'll have this one done in about 15 minutes, hopefully. Knife. So we're gonna make another incision at seven millimeters. Thank you. We call it a Band-Aid incision because that's what it takes is a Band-Aid afterwards. There's no sutures that come out. There's uh, no staples, no glue, no nothing. It's just a Band-Aid and then one stitch. Shot. Okay, good. Watch my guide wire getting down to the disc where the shot, that's the more painful part of the surgery. Good, I can feel the herniation. We're gonna go right through that tear with this dilator. So we're not creating any new problems, tears, shot. We're just moving the dilator through the tear in the back of the disc that we're here to fix anyway. So it's one of the nice things about the surgery is we're not creating any new damage, we're just going through old damage to repair it. Shot. Trevor from YouTube asks, do you lose any disc height with the laser repair? Great question, Trevor, thank you for asking. Do you lose any disc height with the laser repair? No, none whatsoever. Why? Because we're not taking the disc out. We're just cleaning the tear and removing the herniation. Shot. So the, uh, you see right now there's a metal tube uh, and a dilator in the disc space. What that's done is imagine that that disc space is like jello. Okay, and I put this dilator in there and it opens, it goes through the jello and spreads it. And then I take the dilator out. Well, basically, the jello is still there. I haven't taken any away. I just spread it open. And that's what we're doing. I think we're good. Shot. Yeah, we're good. Take it out. So. Yeah, no disc height is lost. Um, and that's why we don't need to put a cage and we don't need to put an artificial disc is we're not taking any of that other disc out. We're just cleaning the tear in the back and um, getting rid of the stuff that's squeezed out into the tear and beyond. So great question. All right, keep the questions coming. That's why we're here. So this patient had back pain for years. I need irrigation. And bilateral leg pain going on now for several months. I don't know the exact duration, but we'll find out tomorrow when we do our post-operative interview. He'll give us the breakdown. Scope off, please. Um, I mean, no scope and, off. and with this surgery, I expect his back and leg pain to go away. Now, the Duke laser disc repair fixes disc, pa disc pain. So it's really important that we make sure the patient has disc pain before they have the surgery. So that's why we do a physical exam. I get a lot of people online, they want me to look at their MRI report and tell them what they need done. I can't do that. 
MRI report doesn't paint the whole picture. There are many herniated discs on MRI reports that don't need surgery, and there are many that do, that are missed. So uh, what it requires is me looking at their body and seeing where their pain is, and then also seeing the actual MRI itself. I can tell you this, radiologists generally miss about 50% of disc injuries that cause pain. And they say it's normal or they underplay it as not significant when it really is. So you really cannot rely on the radiologists. They don't have accurate information when it comes to the source of pain. Laser. Remember, radiologists, for the most part, they're not clinicians. They never see patients. They just sit there and look at a computer screen all day. Now, some of them actually treat patients, but the ones that don't treat, they, under, they don't understand pain sources, okay? And so they just look at an MRI and they wanna call the big stuff, you know, anything that's really big and unusual. But these tears in the back of the disc that are painful, they're not big, they're small. So they're missing this stuff. Very rarely will you even see a radiologist mention an annular tear. But every single disc that's not normal has an annular tear. So why are they leaving it out? They leave it out because they don't think it's important. But it is important. The annular tear is the source of chronic back pain. So that's the problem is you're dealing with basically very ignorant doctors. It's the truth. And it's not necessarily that they want to be ignorant. They're just not being trained properly and taught properly the right information. You know, the truth is doctors can't know everything. So that's why we specialize. And there's just too much information to know. So my specialty is not just neurosurgery, but spinal neurosurgery. So I, I'm really super specialized in spinal neurosurgery. It's all I treat now. And I know everything there is to know about spinal neurosurgery because I want to. I mean, it's a personal choice. It has nothing to do with graduating from med school or residency. There's a lot of doctors that graduate that don't know anything, you know, about a subject matter. But those of us that do, we choose to know. You can get by medical school and get C's and pass and become a doctor. But uh, to really understand medicine and the human body and how different systems interact, you have to study hard and do well in school and you have to learn more than your classmates. So exceptional uh, medical students, exceptional people make exceptional doctors, really is what it comes down to. It has nothing to do with where you went to school or what your title is. It really has to do with your understanding of the disease and how to treat it properly and best so that people have the best results. And that's, again, a personal choice. Look at me, I'm doing endoscopic laser surgery that works. Look at all my colleagues, they're all neurosurgeons, spine surgeons, yet they do bad surgeries that are very invasive and very, very rarely do they result in good outcomes. That's a personal choice. It has nothing to do with a professional. It has to do with personal. If they choose to learn the right way to treat patients, then they'll go out and learn it. If they choose to go to the golf course and golf or go to the bar or hang out with friends, travel, play video games, whatever they decide to do, hang out with their family, that's a personal choice but it affects their professional life. So I made a lot of choices early on to better my knowledge and education so that I could be really good at what I do. It was very important to me personally to be the best neurosurgeon I could be. And not every neurosurgeon feels that way, unfortunately. There's a lot that don't. And that holds true for all specialties no matter what specialty, whether it's pediatrics, whether it's being a pro golfer or a, a jockey, a pilot, whatever you choose in life, 
You can choose to be the best or you can choose just to get by. And uh, I come from a lineage of people that don't just get by. We choose to be the best we can be. So that's why I'm here doing techniques that other neurosurgeons don't even know exist because they haven't taken the time to go out and learn them. Do I blame them? Absolutely, I blame them. Do I blame the residency programs for not training them? Absolutely. Do I blame human greed and selfishness as the core problem? Yes, absolutely. That's the reason why most spine surgeons don't know about this technology. Trust me, I was exposed to the same things they were. I had the same opportunities they did. They just chose not to go further. They chose to accept what they were given and that's it. All right, any other questions? That, no, not this sure. time. That's a herniation by the way, right there. We talk about interposed nucleus herniations. That's an interposed herniation. Stuck in the annular fibers, causing back pain. Now sometimes when I put the dilator through the tear, I push the herniation back into the disc and we can find it in the disc and take it out. In this case, this is a smaller herniation. There was no giant free fragment. So I don't think we're gonna find a big fragment of disc herniation inside this disc. As we get further along, we'll just be basically debulking the annular tear herniation and the extruded herniation but I don't think we're gonna see a big free fragment like we did uh, last case, I think it was, right? By the way, for those of you who came in later, our first patient has already gone home with no pain in her back, no pain in her legs, and uh, we're not putting, she's on no pain medication basically on Tylenol and a muscle relaxer. No narcotics. Yes. You have a question? Sherry from Facebook asks, uh, I had an MRI done and I sent it to you. My question is on the report. It says, I have minimal disc bulge at L1, L2 and L3, L2, L3. Mm -hmm. Why do I have pain going down both legs if the bulge is only minimal? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, I agree with you, Sherry. Um, that doesn't make sense, does it? So, well, we, that's why we do the telemedicine with a Zoom call. I presume we haven't done that yet. Um, I don't know. But if you haven't had your Zoom call with me, it's gonna be this Friday probably. So what I could tell you, I believe without actually um, just kind of a generalization because I don't have your films in front of me and I don't recall if I did review them, the details. So what I would tell you is it's very common for radiologists to miss the cause. And that's why I do my own review. And I ask people to give me their images because the radiologists miss things all the time important things and that's that's you can't fix a human being if you don't know where the problem's coming from so by looking at the mri myself i can see those significant bulges so i'll just tell you um since you're asking me radiologists generally look for the obvious and when it comes to the spine there's really three zones of stenosis narrowing that occur there's the central stenosis, which is the most obvious and easiest to see, and that's what I was told to look for as a neurosurgeon. And then there's two more zones that are very important, and actually the vast majority of people with leg pain have stenosis in these other two zones, not central. So radiologists look for central stenosis. But this other stenosis is called lateral recess stenosis, and foraminal stenosis. 
and the vast majority of people with leg symptoms like yours, they have narrowing of the lateral recess and the neural foramen that's missed by the radiologist because it's not obvious and it takes a very skilled doctor to see it. And that's what I do. I can see it. And I will show it to you on your MRI when I meet with you. And that's what I do during the Zoom call. I'm glad you asked. It's a very important question. And it affects almost everybody out there with back and leg pain. Just about done here, doctor. Literally five minutes, I think, and we'll be done. Good. Yeah, so we've lost five milliliters of blood in this whole surgery. To me, that's a lot, but five milliliters of blood is literally, um, you know, just a little bit of bleeding. It's, it's five times 40, I think 40 drops, no, 20 drops. So it's about 100 drops. It's really nothing. We've never had to do a blood transfusion. We've never had to do anything about bleeding here at, Duke, at the uh, Duke Spine Institute. Even with my fusion surgeries, my open back surgeries and neck surgeries. We've developed techniques to minimize blood loss during spinal surgery, so there's no need for any transfusion. There's no need for hospitalization. Every single surgery we broadcast, including, including the big fusions, is outpatient done right here at Duke Spine Institute in our surgery center, not in a hospital. If you go to YouTube, you'll see we have over 2,000 videos with 1,000 surgeries and then a bunch of testimonials and some other interesting stuff to watch and learn. Uh, great questions today, and I appreciate it. Kevin, you're doing a great job. Thank you for relaying them. All right, our last surgery for the day is going to be a very interesting surgery. It's a um, patient who has pain in their facet joints. So this, these patients, the first two today, were Duke laser disc repair, where we go in and treat back pain coming from a herniated disc. And uh, the pain is actually coming from this herniated disc tear in the back. So by cleaning the tear up, we get rid of the source of inflammation and pain. The point is we're treating a disc that's causing pain. In the next patient, we're treating a different source of pain, something called the facet joint, spelled F-A-C-E-T, joint. And facet joints are really the second most common cause of back pain. Um, I used to believe they were the most common cause. Now I think they're the second most common cause. Um, so that's just what experience teaches you. Sometimes you're wrong. Either way, uh, it's easy to determine the difference between disc pain and facet pain. Facet pain, we do a test called a medial branch block where we numb up the facet joint with Novocaine and we see if it takes their pain away, patient's pain away. If it does, then that means the facet is the cause of the pain. So this patient had facet pain, had a medial branch block, even in a rhizotomy, it worked, but it didn't last. So we know their pain is coming from the facet joint. Now he actually has a fusion in his back. So we're gonna do the facet joints above the fusion and below the fusion. Because that's where his pain is. Now to do this procedure, we're gonna go and do it endoscopically. So we're gonna go in just like we are now, but instead of treating a disc problem, we're gonna treat the facet joints. We started doing these procedures about a month, a month and a half ago. And we've done six or seven patients to date, and every single one of them, their pain is gone completely. So it actually works really well for facet joint pain. Just about done, you can see the fat there. I think we're done here, a um, little bit left here but I don't see any more herniation and the tear is pretty much gone any more questions before I wrap this up no sir all right so this patient will probably go home in about an hour uh, he's done really well
It's kind of like playing a video game. Looking good. Laser off. See if we can see the nerve root up here. It's just buried in fat. That's normal, by the way. Nerves use a lot of energy. There it is, right there. So this is the right L4 nerve root, that white thing. Again, a little bit of fat next to it. Uh, let me have the laser back. And the fat um, gives the nerve root its energy that it uses. Remember, the brain and spinal cord only uses glucose, but nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. They can actually use other energy sources like fat. So, and they do. The brain is a bit of a snob. It only uses sugar. Okay, we're done. Lights on, please. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this bilateral L45, left L5S1 Duke laser disc repair. I know I did. And the patient, I think, is going to be very pleased with his results. And I may say this, but he's actually considering sticking around and having uh, his cervical spine done as well on Thursday because he has painful neck and herniated discs in the neck. Pretty sure I have that story right. All right. Nice job, everyone. We are done. We're going to take this tube out. I'm going to show you the incision. Can you all see this? Can you guys see? This whole surgery was done through this little tube right here. Can you see that? Kevin? Okay. Kevin? Are you there? Yes, Doc. You got you to answer, Chet, right away. Has Kevin stepped away? Yep, I'm back. All right. I was just commenting on how we did the whole surgery through that little tube. Let's show the tube. You guys can see this? All right, let's show uh, this incision. Can you guys see the incisions? Yes, sir. Yep. So when I'm talking to you guys, I need a quick answer. Um, and if you're not able to see it, just say, give me a moment. You see the incision? Yes. Seven millimeters. And we got one on each side. So we're done. I'm going to call the blood loss five mil. No complications. Great job, everyone. So I'll head over there and take any questions. If you want to ask questions, type them up. We just watched a bilateral L45 for herniations at L45 on both sides with bilateral leg pain and a left L5S1 Duke laser disc repair. We're treating and curing back pain and bilateral leg pain. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A band-aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. 
the annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. I'm Dr. Duke Majin, and I'm here with one of my patients who just finished having the Duke Laser Disc Repair Endoscopic Laser Assisted Repair of two herniated discs in his back. And uh, we finished about an hour ago. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling much better. Yeah. Good. And a few minutes ago, we were chatting about your symptoms, and you said that you would have a Charlie horse in your leg. Tell me about that. So, you know, after the, the pain that was in my leg as I would do any morning stretch, just you wake up in the morning and you just reach and you stretch out your body and immediately I would feel a Charlie horse pain throughout the right leg uh, consistently every day. And uh, just, to, just to test it out, just to feel what that would be like, um, I just flex that calf and kind of simulate that and nothing at all. So the leg gone. pain is gone? Gone. And then what about the pain in your lower back there? Do you still have that pain? That pain is gone. Cured? Yeah. Cured, completely. Awesome. awesome. I know you're a little sore from the surgery. Yeah. So why did you decide to do the Duke Laser Disc Repair as opposed to a fusion or something more invasive like that? Well, um, my, my physician uh, recommended me actually to get to, to sent me to a place that I will not name, but <laughs> to get a uh, fusion surgery and um, we looked into reviews and, and, and whatnot, and my wife, God bless her, she said, let's, let's look elsewhere and look for places with the right kind of reviews. This was the first place that showed up with the best reviews. So we immediately had that consultation with you, and everything that you said about laser disc repair and what it would do was exactly what we wanted. Good. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I hear that story about the spouse saving the day <laughs> um, and doing the research. So what's it like for your wife who has to live with you being in pain. You're such a healthy guy. You're really active in the community. You've got students, you're a musician. I mean, what's it like having to deal with, you know, seeing you and your quality of life basically robbed from the back and leg pain? What is that like for her, do you think? That's tough uh, because she's already a mother of two and, and just being a caretaker and having to step up and, and do all the things that two parents need to be doing at home on her own on days where I can't move or I can't function because the pain is so bad. Um, it can be really stressful because yeah. um, it takes two. And so uh, now that we'll be able to do this together again, mm -hmm. it's going to be amazing. You will, but you have to let your back heal so we don't re-injure it, right? That's correct. That's yes, absolutely. But washing dishes, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> you can, you full, can start tomorrow. We can full um, laundry and everything. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, one thing that chronic pain does is it literally robs people of their dignity. And I think that's the best way to say it because human beings are social creatures and we interact, we, we work together, we collaborate together, we assist each other, and we all work towards common goals. And when you're, you're married or you have kids, you have other people dependent on you, you really, if you're in pain all the time and you can't be active, you're always psychologically you're down, physically you're down, and uh, there's, you don't want your kids seeing you in pain and suffering. So sometimes it's easier just to, to take a, a back seat and, um, and that's not how you want your children remembering you. Right. So this is, back pain's a deep thing. A lot of people don't understand it. They just think it's pain on the surface, but it really goes deep into interpersonal relationships and dignity. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the things, best advice I ever got was, it's not always 50-50 and sometimes it stretches in your marriage, that, that 84, uh, you know, 80, 20 and whatnot and back and forth. And for the next year, it's gonna be leaning heavily on my wife, but I know that after that, I'm going to be able to get on the floor with my boys. I'm going to be able to throw the ball around with them, and I'm going to be able to take them uh, to wherever they want to go and, and play at the park with them, and it's, I can't wait. Good for you. Yeah. So tell me just a little bit about your uh, being a musician and 
What are you looking forward to being able to do? Not, don't say lift the piano, whatever you do, okay? <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> we know that's how all this started six years ago. Yes. But what are you looking forward to? How did this pain affect your, your job, your passion, your love for music? I'm on my feet sometimes 12 to 14 hours at a day. And within a few hours of just being on my feet, I can, I can feel that pain. And knowing that I can go through a full day and, and being able to function properly, being able to pick up my saxophone and, bullet, and play uh, comfortably without having to worry about any pain, um, it just, it's, it's, it, it means the world to me. Yeah, it, it sure does. I mean, as a musician, you're totally focused on playing that piece. You put everything into it. You got the music going, you got to keep up, you have the right tempo, the rhythm, and pain can be a massive distraction, right? I, I have an anecdote of that. I mean, I'm sitting in a rehearsal playing and having to make sure that I, my brain becomes more focused on how I was sitting constantly to keep the pain away mm -hmm. so I could play. And, yeah. and now I can focus on the more important things, which is the music making. That's wonderful. We call that fear avoidance behavior. And what it means is moving a certain way, doing a certain thing, you're afraid. You're, you have fear of doing that because you know it's going to bring on the pain. And so your focus, part of your brain is just focused on avoid the pain by avoiding certain movements. It's a distraction. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I look forward to not having to think about that again. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much for everything. You're welcome. My pleasure. I'm Dr. Ari Dugmajan, and thanks for joining me after the surgery we just completed. It's our second surgery for the day. We're broadcasting live spine surgery from Duke Spine Institute. And we've just completed in a patient from Boston who traveled down here to Florida to get his back fixed. He's been living with pain for years in his back, and his pain is now going down into both legs. Many people talk about this kind of leg pain as uh, radiculopathy, Another name is neurogenic claudication, and it gets better when sitting, worse when standing and walking. It's from nerves being pinched in the spine. And I talked a little bit about this during the surgery where a lot of radiologists, they only look at the part of the spine that is the center of the spine. And the center of the spine, if we take a look here at the spine, I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about. I'm gonna put the spine on end and you guys can see here, okay? So looking on end, you have the vertebral body or disc in this area. And then you have this, this tube, and that's called the spinal canal. And right here you have facet joints and a pedicle. That's the bone right there. So the nerves run in the center part here and they run down. The radiologists are always looking in this area for narrowing, but there's rarely any narrowing in this area. All the narrowing happens in the foramen, which is actually right in here, in the neural foramen. And that's from the herniated disc off to the side. You can't really see that when you look down the center. So that's why stenosis, which causes pinched nerves, comes from herniated disc in this area over here, from here to here. And that's the area that the radiologists miss all the time. Literally, if I took a thousand MRIs and read the reports, the radiologists missed that 90% of the time, at least 90% of the time. They just don't know how to read foraminal narrowing, foraminal stenosis, so they leave it out. But that's where these herniated discs hit the nerves as the nerves exit the spine. That's why people get leg symptoms, and then they don't know why, because the radiologist missed it. So that's why you need somebody like me who knows exactly what to look for as the source of the pain. And I look at that MRI and I look at each and every slice. So I go through it one cut, one picture at a time. And I work my way down and I look at what's called the um, sagittal views, sagittal T2 weighted views. And basically that's slicing through the spine this way and then kind of looking at the side. And I can actually see these holes where the nerves come out. And if there's a herniated disc, hitting the nerve right here, I can actually see that on the T2 sagittal images. The other image I look at is the T2 axial. That's slicing through the disc this way. Sometimes the radiologists don't do it right. 
Um, the gantry angle is wrong, so they slice through at this angle. You really want to slice through parallel to the disk so you can get the most out of the, uh, the image. Long story short, it takes a lot of experience and knowledge to be able to reconstruct in the mind, to be able to see three-dimensionally what's happening, where the nerves are being affected and not. And that's, you know, something that I can't teach somebody to do over the phone. It's not something you learn how to do in a couple of days. It takes years of experience. So I combine those years of experience in reading MRI scan images, combined with my experience and knowledge about the most common discs that cause pain in the back or neck, you know, where are they located, L45, L5S1, then L34, and then of course the physical exam where the patient is pointing to where their pain is. So I use those three things, experience, MRI, physical exam, to put together the cause of everybody's back and neck pain. And being able to do that successfully is very rare. There aren't a lot of doctors that can do that. Once I figured out the source of pain, then being able to go in and fix it in a minimally invasive fashion, well, that's what Duke Spine Institute does better than anyone else. That's why people travel here from Boston, from Virginia, from Puerto Rico, from other countries like Canada. They come here because we can fix their pain. All right, so this patient's surgery is complete and it went really well. I expect this patient to do fantastic. I'm gonna interview him tomorrow when he comes in for his post-op visit and we will post his uh, interview tomorrow for everyone to see on YouTube. All right, do we have any questions? What do you think about the long-term durability of L5 S1 fusion made by just screws without TLIF or PLIF cages? Yeah, great question. So someone's asking, hey, Dr. Duke, what is the long-term durability of a fusion done um, at L5-S1, which is the bottom disc, without the use of a cage, an inner body cage. That's your inner body cage right there. So basically the surgeon's going in and putting these screws into the pedicle of L5-S1, and then they connect the screws with the rod. That surgery's durability is not that good. Um, the reason is you have no anterior middle column support, so there's no graft to share the load of the spine and all that weight goes onto the screws basically because you have an incompetent disc at 5.1 so that all the weight of your body comes down on that 5.1 and literally gets transmitted to these screws. So the failure rate of the screws is very high. They can break, they get loose. Both of those create problems for the patient. I always use an inner body cage at 5.1 when I do an inner body fusion. Unless the disc is super strong and um, you know, if that's the case, why are you doing surgery? So you really aren't. Um, so I always put cages in when I reconstruct the spine for a variety of reasons. The number one reason, provide anterior middle column support for load sharing for your construct. Number two, uh, it also allows rest restoration of lower doses. So it shifts the curve from forward to backwards, which is the proper natural alignment of the lumbar spine. All right, thank you all for watching. I think that's our last question, and uh, we'll be back in about 30 minutes with our last surgery, which is a long one. It's going to be a bilateral L2-3, L5-S1 laser endoscopic rhizotomy. And this is for patients who have pain coming from their facet joint as opposed to a herniated disc. So the two most common causes of back pain that's chronic are herniated disc, and then the second most common cause is arthritis in this joint right here called the facet joint. Um, herniated disc pain, you just saw what we do. We do a Duke laser disc repair. For facet pain, we do what's called a rhizotomy. Well, a lot of times rhizotomy doesn't work because it's done, the technique is kind of, you're guessing where the nerve is and you're putting a needle down and then the needle probe they're using is very weak. So we go in endoscopically, we find that nerve right here and I use a laser to burn the nerve. And that takes the pain away from the facet joint. It's a technique that I learned from Dr. Anthony Young out of uh, Phoenix, who's now retired, who I admire the most of all spine surgeons I've ever worked with. Dr. Young kind of pioneered that technology endoscopically. And I learned it from him and we've been applying it here at Duke Spine with great success. So we're gonna be performing this on one of our very special patients. Um, and we'll see how he does. All right, that'll be next.